Welcome to the Q&A Cafe. Um, I, we, are, we have gone on the road for this episode. We're actually doing something we've uh, not done before. We've come to the guest. And in this case, it's Eric Ziebold, who is the owner and chef of Kinship and Metier. Uh, across the street from the DC Convention Center, which I can see out the window there. And um, welcome, Eric. Oh, thank you. Thank you. For me. I realize you're celebrating just a little bit after your six month anniversary of, I should say, opening, not right. being here. Right. And um, before we talk about all the wonderful things uh, that we're going to talk about, including wine and herbs and your menus, it was interesting driving over here. I always like to time stamp our interviews a little bit. and. Uh, We've just been through two weeks of incredible violence uh, in the world, in Bangladesh, in Iraq, in uh, Turkey, um, and now this week in Baton Rouge and uh, Minneapolis, and uh, this very overnight before we ta taped this in, in Dallas, uh, many people killed, largely gun violence and terrorism. And it occurred to me while I was driving over here that that goes right to what a restaurant is about. It's a refuge, isn't it? It's a refuge from the world. Right. It, it, it certainly it's a respite, it's, especially with what we do. Yeah. Um, it's a way for, for people to get away. Yeah, no, and so um, uh, with that in mind, uh, as awful as the world is out there, we are going to celebrate the refuge that you have created here. We have some champagne, so maybe we should start with a sip. Absolutely. I'm going to have to, excuse me, guys. <laughs> But cheers to you and to Celia, your wife. Uh, you did this together. Right. I think it's awesome. And at home, I'd like you to fill your champagne flutes, too, because you believe, Eric, that champagne flutes will never go out of style, correct? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I guess, call me a classicist, call me a traditionalist, call me somebody that likes tradition. Yeah, but you break the rules uh, a lot, too. <laughs> sure, um, but uh, uh, I, I recently was talking about that, and I had to quote, you know, Coco Chanel. Um, you know, not fashion, a bad person to quote. No, not at all. She, she, she has endured. Amazing, amazing woman, <laughs> right? And and you know, to be um, to be relevant mm -hmm. uh, for for as long as as she has. Or her line has is, is spectacular, and you know that idea that um, fashion is a fad and style is forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for me, you know, the champagne flute uh, is just that, very stylish. I love the coupe too, but you never see the bubbles the way you do in a flute. Right. The beauty of a flute, especially when you're having a particularly high-end bottle, is that incredible view of the bubbles flying up into the air. So, um, I wanted to start with something that goes to you celebrating your new restaurant. Um, Washingtonian Magazine uh, in January wrote, uh, Kinship, the most exciting DC restaurant opening of the year. That must have been a, a particularly happy way to start. <laughs> and has yes, it been it's, since? <laughs> right, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to get things kicked off, especially given all the challenges of you know weather and snow and more snow and, and may I add and power construction. outages. Right. Um, so with with you know seeming like everything was was going against us at one yeah. point. Um, you know, the one thing that, that wasn't were the, the people coming through the doors. Yeah. Um, and wow. so it's been, a, it's been a great first six months. Well, there was a lot of anticipation, and I want to talk about that. And I want to uh, go back a little bit. And I'm actually going to quote myself, because in 2008, when you were the uh, chef at City Zen, the highly acclaimed chef at City Zen at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, um, which you had opened, I believe, in 2004. Yep. In 2008, you let me come over and spend a day with my camera watching the whole process of how you prepared for the evening service. And uh, you came in, as I recall, about 11 AM or noon. But your staff was there much earlier. For all I know, we're taping now at about 11.30 in the morning. You may have a kitchen bustling down Oh, oh yes, yes, we do. But I wrote in the story I did about you, um, I said, it's not unusual in Washington to meet people who've come here from somewhere else. Usually they give up the sticks for a chance at power or at least access to power on the Hill or in the White House. So when a man, especially a chef, gives up Napa and bypasses New York for a chance at culinary fame in the nation's capital, that's news. In this case, it's XX year old Eric Zebold, the chef at Susan <laughs> Restaurant. Now what I particularly loved about learning for, about you, and we will go, we, I do want to follow your journey, is you grew up in Iowa. You're an Iowa boy. Indeed. You know, born and raised, lived there for the first 20 years of, of Ames? my life. Ames? Was it Ames? Yeah, Ames, Iowa. Uh, what is Ames, Iowa like? 
It's, you know, it's a college town. Iowa State University is there, mm -hmm. and uh, so when school's in session, uh, you know, there's a lot more activity, um, you know, with the university. Mm -hmm. There's there's a, a, an auditorium there, a C.Y. Stevens Auditorium, so you've got some theater productions and whatnot. Uh, you have all the sporting events. Um, you have a very young community. So so during the, during the school year, it's a very, you know, hot and, and happening town for Iowa. Um, it's not just cornfields. Right. No, not at all. <laughs> um, but then in the summertime, it is basically just cornfields. That's what, you know, most of the people that I know, we all did growing up, was you did one of two things. Either you detasseled corn or you walked beans. And you spent <laughs> from sun up to sundown, you know, in the fields, you know, doing work. Um, and that's, you know, that. That was a summer job. Yeah. What did your parents do that you ended um, up in Iowa? My father moved there to work for the local newspaper. Really? Yeah, the Ames Tribune was the circulation Was he a there. journalist? No, no, he... he was a publisher uh, or yeah. the business side? Right, right, the business side of it. And your mother? My mother was a teacher. Okay, at, at the university or No, she school? taught, when she first moved to Ames, taught third grade. And was cooking part of the family experience? You know, my mother cooked uh, in, in your typical, I think, you know, stereotypical mm -hmm. American household. My mom did all the cooking indoors, and my dad did all the grilling outside. Yeah, there you go. Um, and being a teacher, my mom was home at three mm -hmm. uh, so every day, she had time. and and so she, yeah, she would make you know dinner. And we didn't have any family in the area, so um, as as much as anything, I would say yes, there was time spent in the kitchen. But I would say even probably more influential mm -hmm. with me was the time spent at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. And it was very much an environment where, you know, you could, I'd be out playing, you know, baseball or, or football or running around doing whatever it was. But when you sat down at the dinner table, you took your hat off and it mm -hmm. was now dinner time. And, and, you know, the story I always tell is um, there was a time, keep in mind, this is pre, you know, cell phones. Right. Um, we, we had the rotary dial up on the, on the wall. Yeah. Uh, dinner was at six o'clock <laughs> every night. I that way too, right? yeah. <laughs> and, you know, if the phone rang during dinner, it was like, oh God, help me. Please don't let it be for me. Please don't let it be for, because you would, you would get this, this look from, from my parents, like who's calling you during dinner time? Yeah. Don't they understand? Exactly. And no TV on either. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, it was a time for, you know, all of us to sort of catch up on, on what was going on in, mm -hmm. in our lives. I'm happy I had that kind of dinner table experience yeah. too, though having, um, Two brothers and one sister, it often got kind of heated and vocal. Did you have brothers and sisters? I did. I had, uh, I had one sister. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way we worked it at the house was, since my mom, you know, primarily did the cooking, mm -hmm. um, either my sister or I would have to, to set the table and the other one would have to clear the table. Yeah, yeah. Um, inevitably, even if I set the table, my sister would play the game of getting me to talk about something after mm -hmm. dinner and I would essentially forget and mm -hmm. start doing the dishes without, you know, without realizing it. What a good, what a good son and brother. Yeah, um, the advantage of being older for and her. And then of course that's why one becomes a chef because then you never have to do the dishes <laughs> again. But <laughs> I don't want to get too far ahead. Do you, what do you remember, when, when do you discover, was it in growing up in Ames, Iowa that you discovered the, what food tasted like? That, that it hit you, that you really kind of dug this thing about you know, eating food and making food and where it came from and what you could do with it? Well, I think that um, I always enjoyed eating. I think that the, the big part of where I became obsessed about food in the beginning for me was actually because I wrestled. And, <laughs> yeah. And, okay, you're going to have to explain that. Well, and, and my natural weight as a senior in high school was 160 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I wrestled 135. So you would drop 25 pounds in order to, to do this. And, you know, once you weighed in the morning, it didn't actually matter what you weighed that night when you went out on the mat to wrestle. And so you became obsessed as you got closer and closer and closer to, to, to weigh-ins. I'm like, oh God, what am I gonna eat? You know, what am I gonna eat after I've tipped the scale? What am I gonna eat, what am I gonna eat? And I really became obsessed with it, you know, from that standpoint. What did you crave? Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's funny. I think that when uh, a, a huge assortment of stuffs mm -hmm. and what I think happens at that point when you really get in tune with your body is sometimes I would crave a glass of, of milk. Sometimes I'd crave yeah. a banana. Sometimes I would crave, you know, a glass of orange juice. Did you make anything for yourself or did you rely on your mother to do that? No, I made a lot of it um, myself mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, at that point, everything I, I um, ate got weighed as well. Oh my God. So. Do you recall <clears throat> yourself being creative? 
Uh, you know, I was creative from the standpoint of, of you know, back then uh, media was much different than it is today. So I would go through like all the you know better homes and gardens and mm -hmm. and you know look for books. recipes yeah. and things that I wanted to. You wanted to, make. to follow the rules. Yeah. Because you were learning. Yeah. You don't start breaking the rules until you right. think you've learned everything. Um, well, what was the what was the trajectory? For, what, what what were you and your family thinking was going to be your profession as you were going up through high school and? You know, we really weren't sure. I was, I was, um, I took a lot of business classes, mm -hmm. and you know, keep in mind in the in the '80s in Iowa, the idea of, of being a chef isn't what it is today. I would say it's pretty much like saying to mom and dad, "I think I'm going to go to Hollywood and become a movie star." <laughs> you know, and you get the same reaction. But 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 you're right. Being a, a chef, especially a man in America, this is this wasn't France. This no. wasn't Europe. And back then. Uh, even more so, we didn't have Top Chef on TV, no. you know, so that you could say, "Look, Mom and Dad, chefs." Uh, so you were probably felt a little bit charting your own course, right? Well, I, I, what I ended up doing was I went to to University of Northern Iowa for two years, and mm -hmm. I started studying. Um, uh, you know, it's under undergrad mostly, but did did take some business classes while I was there. And at some point, I just said. You know, um, I'd, I'd done an enormous amount of, of summer field work, um, and I'd saved a pretty fair amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I said, you know, listen, I want to I want to go to culinary school, and it's you know, uh, the CIA at that time was was incredibly expensive, yeah. um, and I'd saved enough money to pay for for a, a portion of it, um, and I made the decision to go. Did you know what you were going to do with that education? You know, I I I was pretty pretty simple at that time. Yeah, it no, was like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and I'm gonna you know get a degree in in and hopefully that's gonna be my entryway into cooking and hopefully I get to cook for the rest of my life. Because it's I think that you said something that you probably tell all young chefs study some business, mm -hmm. because um, you need to know if you think you're gonna own a restaurant, you need to know how to read a spreadsheet. Right. You need to know what what's going out and what's coming in and uh, th that business component of your education has probably served you all the way through, you know, as well as knowing what garlic does. Right. Yeah, it's, I mean, understanding that there's there's a lot of parts that mm -hmm. need to work together. If you want to own your own place. Right, in order to make a if you just want to work for somebody, right. you can just know how to that. cook. Right. right. Um, so you went to CIA, did you, did you, do you, I'm saying this is knowing that you believe in apprentice programs, you believe in that yeah. European experience of bringing young people into the kitchen, very young, right. and um, uh, grooming them to uh, you know, have a life as a chef or whatever in, role in the kitchen. Do you think CIA, given how much food has exploded and restaurants have exploded in, in, in America, do you think CIA is still as relevant as it was when you went there? You know, I think it, I think it can be for the right students. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I went there, um, there was no place else to go. No, there, there, there weren't. There wasn't near the prolifer proliferation that there was today. But as well, I really took advantage of it while I was there. I, I um, worked on campus as well, yeah. um, assisting with some of the classes. So I really got sort of a twofold education. <clears throat> I think that that the challenge of going sort of the apprenticeship route is having an in into the industry, mm -hmm. um, so that you get taken seriously. Uh, because it is a very competitive. But you need that first door <laughs> open, right? Correct. So that the other doors can open, right? And, and so going to going to culinary school sort of validates that you know this is something you're committed to. Did you have a lot of chutzpah? <clears throat> I mean, were you, you know, getting that door open? How'd you get that first door open? I was uh, I was lucky that that while I was at the, well I got to, to culinary school because the chef that I worked for in Iowa, Matt Nichols, yeah. had gone to work at Spago. So I got my, one of my letter, letters of recommendation on Spago Letterhead, which, which helped. That's a good beginning. Uh, right. And then while I was there, one of the instructors that I did a lot of, um, I assist, you know, was a, a, a you know, teacher's assistant for him, essentially, um, knew Jeff Boobin. And here in Washington. Here in Washington. Who created Vidalia. Right. And, yeah, and, and at this time, Jeff had just opened Vidalia. Yeah. Because so, Jeff opened Vidalia in 93, and I graduated in 94. So it was in 93. That I had this instructor, you know, I told him I wanted. To, I was thinking about coming to Washington, mm -hmm. and he recommended that Why I. Why Washington? I'd been down here. We closed for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. The school That's shut. CIA, the school yeah. shut down. Yeah. You wanted to see the other CIA. Right. <laughs> yeah, I probably didn't get a lot, take a lot of tours over Thanksgiving of, of the of, of that CIA, 
Um, but I had friends here, and it was closer than going back to Iowa. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up coming down here uh, for a couple of Thanksgivings, and I really loved like what it. I saw in Washington. Uh, so your first restaurant job, real big time restaurant job, was at, with Jeff Bubin. Yeah. Was it at Vidalia? Yeah. And what was your role? I was a chef to party, mm -hmm. uh, the Poisson. Which is so why I, I cooked a. I, it's a line cook that, mm -hmm. um, and I was uh, entry working level a fish job station. in a way. Yeah. An entry level job on the line, right. and the line is for those people who may not be working in restaurants. Those are the. Those are. It is literally the line. It is getting things moved along until it gets to the chef to say, okay, this can go out to the customer. You're the. You're the last. You're the last person to look at the plate. Right. Uh, uh, I think people forget sometimes, or they don't know, and that's okay, and, and, and we can educate them that, that when you become the head chef, such as you are, you're involved during the day in many ways prepping the food. I mean, I've watched you make corn soup right. from the actual corn husks, and it's a process that you start hours before the soup's actually finished and served, but by the time the restaurant opens and the food's going out to the customers, the chef is really relying on that line. Right. To, to fulfill all your, your, your procedures, techniques, and whatnot of the dishes that you've created for your menu, and you're the last person to see it. Right. So working the line really prepares you for that. So you go to Jeff Bubin, and you work at Vidalia. You're on the line. Right. Do, you, do, you, do you get promoted while you're there? Uh, no, I, I worked at all the stations on the line. I was there for about two years, and then I left. To go to uh, the French Cal Laundry yeah. to in Yonville, which you know, and and saying to go to the French Laundry, that's that that's like you're going you're going right up to the to the top. <laughs> so how did that happen? Well, and but keep in mind that the French Laundry in 1996 is not the French Laundry that we we all but know today. But it was today. the beginning. You were there at the beginning of the movement. Correct. You Correct. know, and that's you know sometimes the best time to be right. there. How did you meet Thomas Keller, the owner of the French Laundry? Well, what what happened was, um, and what I where I say it was in the early days is I had wanted to move back to California, mm -hmm. and Jeff said, um, "Well, okay, if you're really you know insistent upon leaving, then you need to go check out this place in Napa, the French Laundry." And uh, you know he said, in my in his opinion, in the next three years, this is going to be considered one of the top three restaurants in America. He had a goal. You know, I'm You're a, bright, a bright, bright guy, yeah, Jeff no, is. No, I, and, and so I, I went out there, and um, that was probably the moment where I was really amazed by food and what you could make things taste like. And um, I mean, the things, you know, in 1996, um, what We weren't was, calling it farm to table <laughs> yet, were we? Or, or, right. or nose to tail. Right. Or, yeah, yeah. There, <laughs> or at, that, at that point, it just happens. You know? Right, right. Uh, we, we would have people that, that dropped off plums or figs or whatnot yeah. at, the, at the back door. Um, and you just, you just worked with it. We didn't, you're right, we didn't have as many key and, phrases. You know, and interesting, the more they hear, more people show up at the right. back door. With, yeah. uh, and I think also with the French Laundry, you tell me, did you discover service there? Absolutely. I mean, uh, Laura Cunningham, who was the general manager while I was there, uh, I, I would say um, helped uh, all of the sous chefs and me when I was the chef de cuisine um, learn and understand not just the service side of the restaurant, but how to better manage you know people in general. Mm -hmm. um, Laura really you training. Know, yeah, and, and, and Laura opened the eye, our, our eyes for seeing the whole picture and the, and the big picture and understanding that, that that side of it was you know incredibly important. But in, in a capacity that we were all in it working together. Yeah, and I mean, and the thing is, the customer experience, as much as it is what you're doing in the kitchen and the food on the plate, it's the front of the house right. that can fail you or take you to the highest heights. Right. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's one of the wonderful things about a great restaurant is when you see all of that come together, and it's and I, and then you went to Wolfgang Puck. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to ask is, uh, so you've got Jeff Bubin, you've got Thomas Keller, you've got uh, Wolfgang Puck, these are all incredible chefs. What, what have you stolen from them? <laughs> what were your takeaways? I mean, what did you, right. what did you, what, what, what is, if I look at this menu now, your wonderful menu, I love this menu. Um, can you look at it and you see a little bit of Thomas Keller here, a little bit of Wolfgang Puck there, a little yeah, bit of Jeff Bubin here? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think the, the thing that I, the biggest thing that I took from, from Jeff was probably um, A, bringing a kitchen together, and then B, like the, um, 
the importance of, of American cuisine and American provincial cooking. I mean, I, you know, in the, in the early 90s, that idea of American regional cuisine was just taking off. And you had, you know, Charlie Palmer doing Oriole and David Burke doing Park Avenue Cafe in New York. But you had Jeff Boobin doing Vidalia and Bob Kincaid, you know, oh, doing, Kincaid, doing Kincaid's, yeah, right. you know, here yeah. in Washington. Yeah. Really, as people that were classically French trained, but you know, passionate about American regional cooking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's, I think, you know, if you, you, you know, you'll see Jeff probably the most in the history section because um, there's a lot of plays on, you know, American classics. Um, the anthropology of food, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, uh, it's, um, so you come here to walk, well, I, I should, I've left out one other little uh, trip you made or detour you made, and that was you went with um, Thomas Keller when he opened up Per Se in mm -hmm. New York. That's actually where you met Celia, right? Yeah. Am I correct? So that was an important point in your journey. And uh, but you, you per se is amazing, but you didn't want to stay there. You wanted to get back here. Yeah, yeah. I I I stayed on to, to help open per se, but Thomas and I had been talking about me leaving, you know, at that point, um, and to uh, because I wanted to move back to Washington, you know, and, and the French Laundry wasn't in Washington. No, it wasn't going. And no. And so how did how did did you know you wanted to move here and have your own place, or were you thinking if I can just get a job? No, I, ideally I wanted to, to move here and open my own restaurant. So how do you make that happen? What connections did you use? How did you get the Mandarin Oriental to give you that restaurant? Well, what, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's funny what happened. I was, I was at Per Se, so, you know, Per Se really well, there's a pretty good open, marker on your resume. Opened, okay. opened a personal yeah. and professional door for right. me uh, was that I'd, I'd met somebody. And that was a, that was, that was a Mandarin, right? Is yeah. that a Mandarin uh, hotel? Uh, there is a Mandarin. There is a Mandarin. It's part of that so. complex, yeah. Yeah. the Columbus right. Circle. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so yeah, so so Mandarin was the neighbors, but uh, uh, Daniel DeVoe, who did um, corporate PR for, mm -hmm. for Mandarin, uh, was there with uh, Jennifer Luzzi, and um, I'd done an event uh, that Jennifer was at um, as well in Thailand, and so we were chatting, and she said, wow, I thought you were moving to Washington. And I said, yeah, I'm still looking for restaurant space. And she said, wow, Mandarin's looking for a <laughs> chef. And you know, I flew down and, and talked to them. And um, you know, the whole thing happened Did you have quickly. to compete? Or was it always yours? No, well, you know, it, was, it, was, it, was, supposed like to be, it was supposed to be John George uh, oh, was supposed to be doing the that. restaurant. Originally, it was Alan Wong, and then it was going to be John George. Mm -hmm. And uh, for whatever reason, they were looking to go in a, a different direction. Uh, so I came down and I, I interviewed, interviewed with um, the general manager, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, Ellen Gale, who was doing PR for Mandarin Washington at that time, and uh, Hide Yamamoto, who was the executive mm -hmm. chef. And I talked to them about you know what it was that I would do with the space if it was mine. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it too was that it wasn't open yet. Right. So you had this opportunity to shape it to yeah. uh, to suit you, and you opened and you took off and you were a sensation from the beginning. And, and for 10 years, and while you were there, you won the James Beard Award, you won many other accolades, you had all kinds of people flocking to dine in there, you know, the Washington power scene, you had the First Lady, you had Robert De Niro, I mean, you, you know, you just, I, I can remember seeing, remember seeing sports stars in there too, which I always thought was cool. But, uh, but then you did this most amazing thing, I think, because um, there you are in the corporate lap, taken care of. You're very, it's got to be a cushy existence when your restaurant's in a hotel. I mean, I'm sure they're looking at your budgets, but it's not quite like when it's your own place. Right. And then you and Celia take a big leap. I'm sure you have investors. I'm sure you've got some protections, but still to open your own place is a, is a kind of bold and uh, your own place outside of the hotel right. womb. Um, how long was that? How long was that? Were you talking about it? And did it was it? Did you find it a daunting decision, or was it an easy decision? In the end, I think it ended up being an easy decision. Because uh, the for, money was there. For, no, you know, it wasn't even that. It was, um, you know, the 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 dining scene nationally has changed a lot oh, yeah. in the last 10, 10, 12 years. The dining scene in Washington it's has amazing. changed astronomically yeah. in the last twelve years. And on a relative scale to the rest of the country, I think the change here has probably been one of the most dramatic. And I would absolutely agree with that. You know, because once upon a time we were a city that had Jean Louis, mm -hmm. and to some extent Jean Pierre Goyenval, right. and but you know now we're it's just popping everywhere, right. and um, and 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 we've got Michelin coming to town, and that's that's a. 
imprimatur that, that matters, you know, whether, whether the chef population is happy or perplexed <laughs> about Michelin coming to town. It is happy. It's very, happy. very happy. It's happy. Are, are you going to be happy regardless of how you rank in it? You know, this, this is, yes. Um, it, it's an amazing opportunity, I think, for Washington. I mean, I think we can feel confident you'll be in it, but... but. I, you know, we, we hope so. That's certainly something we, we work towards. <laughs> gonna, I'm going to um, question right. their judgment. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, a path, and you're, you know, on the process of, of uh, always making, you know, yeah. your, your next dish better than your last. Um, but, you know, as much as anything, you know, in today's age, it's really a global community. Yeah. And so to be a part, you know, of, of a group of, of guidebooks that is, is, is international, mm -hmm. um, there's not that many nationally. Um, it sets Washington on a great stage, I think, as, as um, a fantastic city to, to come visit. And I think that hopefully, um, you know, the European market looks at it and says, wow, there's some great restaurants in Washington. Yeah, Maybe so I look for a job there because right. it would, you know, certainly. For the traveling, for yeah. the traveling diner. Well, and for, and for young cooks, you right. know, it, it's, it's another, you know, job opportunity. In a world of Top Chef and Yelp uh, and social media, do critics still matter? Absolutely. I think, I think critics matter. Who, who do they matter to? Uh, the, you know, the critics, there, there is um, it, a, a, a review is a way of getting, you know, uh, word out there very quickly. Um, but do you on, care as much about what's, about what's written about you on Yelp or other websites, you know, so, you know social words, almost, you know, the crowd, I guess, TripAdvisor is another one. I mean, what, where, where, what, what's going what's gonna, to what's gonna gut you if it's not as good as you thought it should be? Well, I think if you know, reviews ever even got you. I don't know. Yeah, if I mean, I, I think that you read, you know, with with social media and, and those type of things. I think that you 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 need to read um, what's going on. I think you need to be aware of, mm -hmm. of what's going on. Um, you know, taste is subjective. Yeah. Everybody's going to have an opinion. Did so you, you have to had understand. A bad that. review. Uh, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. We've had a bad review. I can't find one. <laughs> I mean, I mean, maybe you judge a bad review by that it's less than you thought it was going to be, but you've had a, you've had an, and it's deserved. I mean, I, I, I can understand that. Um, while we're talking, when this is on, when with people watching, they're, we're going to be seeing pictures of your food and seeing pictures of the restaurant. How would you describe your, how, what is Eric Ziebold cuisine? I think that um, I'm, I'm sort of a classicist naturalist mm -hmm. is what I would say. Um, Do you call it, it American? Would you um, want to be called if, an American? If, yeah, from that, from, from that, you know, uh, if we're, you know, divining it um, in those capacities, yes, definitely, you know, uh, American. Um, from the standpoint of, you know, what does that mean? That means that um, I like to celebrate America the melting pot. Mm -hmm. um, and we like to celebrate, you know, a lot of the bounty that, you know, exists in America yeah. uh, from a product standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, and blending the, the two of those. Um, being classically trained, you know, you see a lot of the technique that goes into mm -hmm. what it is that we're cooking. Um, but that idea of, you know, making something taste like what it is and trying to draw out the well, essence of, of what it is. Which makes me think of some of your signatures and the one that's getting all the, the, the press. And I, and I don't know if it's, a, if it's a burden or a blessing when you come up with something that becomes, you know, an item. And, uh, uh, but your, your, your torsion mm -hmm. of white mushrooms. Um, uh, that isn't what it is. I mean, it tastes like something else, and yet in the most wonderful way. Um, does that make you happy when you have something like that? that that's like everybody who walks in the door is going, I've, I've got to have this. And you're thinking, well, I want you to try this new thing, too. Or people coming in and saying, oh, but do I get to try the Parker House rolls? And, and then you've got another one here now, which is the lobster French toast. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the best thing about um, signature dishes, yeah. and, and I, I never would have pictured the mushroom torsion becoming a signature dish. So that but, surprised you? Um, it did. You must did. have known you were onto something pretty amazing. Yes. Uh, I didn't know it would, it would resonate with, as it with, did. with quite as many people as did. It you did you create it in your home kitchen? No, that was actually, it was one that we, that we came up with at Citizen. Oh, okay. Um, right. And we came up with it after a, a trip to France. There you go. But so. it surprised you that it was, uh, that you're going to have to have it on the menu forever. 
Well, forever is a very long time. <laughs> well, I mean, and you know, I, 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 I feel somewhat guilty as one of the noisemakers about the Parker House roles. I think I probably, I should apologize for giving you a hard time about that, but they are pretty sensational. And that was your, that was your first kind of signature hit at City's End. And, you, and I remember you were somewhat tormented about how you were gonna play them here, and you figured it out beautifully. You have, a, you have an area on the menu that's family style dishes, that meaning they could be for two, three, I think some of them could even be for four people. And then you get the Parker House rolls. And then since we're two restaurants here, we're sitting in Kinship, but downstairs uh, on the floor below us, you have Metier, mm -hmm. and uh, they come with the meal there. Right. So let's talk for a moment a little bit about the difference between Kinship and Metier. Sure. Uh, kinship is, um, a la carte, mm -hmm. and it's this menu, and it is um, a lot of a lot of different choices. I mean, you know, you can come in here and you can eat small, large, medium. You're, you're absolutely right. You can come in and do whatever Every you want. want. But but there are the there are the for the table. To, you know, I'm I'm just going to say there's craft, history, ingredients, and indulgence. And each of these menus could be ordered all the way through and down to dessert. Or you can yeah. at, at, they 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 could be. Um, it's set up. It looks sort of like a tasting menu. But you can but mix, not. you can match, you can order one course, you can order four courses. It, it really. And what would you say the price point is for two people to have dinner here with wine? You know, to be honest with you, that really, that really depends yeah, on whether, I would say, whether you want just a, a casual well, you know, Wednesday night and, uh, you know, an I've appetizer. I've come in and, and sat a, at the bar and it's yeah. been, uh, I have one dish and a glass of wine, but I've also come here and had a full dinner and, right. and wine. And it's, uh, you know, you've got to come here you're, you're paying for quality, right. and so you've got to prepare to do that. Downstairs in Metier, which is this menu, it is a pre-fee. Yes. And the pre-fee is what, $200? $200 uh, service included. Service included, but not wine. Correct. And so is there a separate wine uh, that you would pay a, a wine premium that you, or do you just the, presumably order your wines by the bottle? We do have a couple, uh, we have a couple options as far as pairing goes at, mm -hmm. at different price points. One at uh, 150 and one, uh, sorry, one at 100 and one at 150. So it's a special occasion. Uh, yeah. Or if you're a, 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 a real foodie, it's once a week, but with a big, big bank account. Um, but uh, with Metier, when I say pre-fee, it's also a tasting menu. How mm -hmm. many courses? Seven courses. Seven courses. So you've got a plan to be here for about two hours, yeah. wouldn't you say? And yeah. um, I would, you know, if it was me, I would take my time and relax and enjoy. Come for there's, three hours. There's a private salon in, yeah. in Metier. That it should we, be an evening. I think that's exactly yeah. what Metier should be. It should yeah. be that night that you've set aside just right. for the luxury of dining and putting, you know, in your hands. So, and kinship is pretty luxurious, too. Uh, you're very proud of your wine list. It just got uh, a big honor from the wine enthusiast. Yeah. And I know you love your wine. Uh, I think what, I don't know if it's your garage at home, or <laughs> it just is. Your, it's your garage at home. It's where you keep a lot of your own personal wine, and I imagine some of the wine that's now here. But um, I remember being there one night, and you were having a lot of people autograph your wall. Uh, how, how is the wall doing? Is it just flooded with names? Now? Well, we, we opened a restaurant, so, so I you're not so I so I worked anymore. right. I worked the first 87 <laughs> days we were open. Um, so yeah, we don't do quite as much entertaining, but that was for me uh, when we moved to um, Alexandria and, and uh, we, we got a little bit of a bigger house, that was the selling point for me, was, uh, was being able to build out a wine cellar yeah. um, in the garage. Um, Where, because you did marry Celia and you have a daughter mm -hmm. and uh, you still have some home life. And, do you, I remember when you had Cities Zen, you'd close in January for a couple of weeks. Will you do that here? Yeah, we closed in January, we closed in August. We'll probably do that with Metier. Um, but this is gonna closed, be here. But you know, Kinship will probably stay open. Do you feel um, an ebb and flow from the convention center here, being that you're literally across the street on 7th Street? Not at, not as much as, as one may think, and that's um, in large part, I think, what we feel a lot more in the bar, but we're very fortunate that the dining room is generally pretty booked yeah. up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, was, it was actually a very um, similar problem to what we had at Mandarin, where hotel, to, to hotel guests would arrive and then they'd try and make a reservation, and, and the restaurant was already booked and they couldn't get in, <clears throat> which was always a little tricky. Um, but uh, the convention center people aren't paying three hundred dollars for a hotel room, so I don't. But have to I want to about commend that. you for taking reservations in a busy city like Washington, where a lot of us just have so little control over our time. Right. To be able to make a reservation is a real courtesy, 
and to, to, to have to go stand in line to eat. I, I, there's some restaurants I love that require that, but I can't go because I just can't go because I don't have the time to stand in line. I know a lot of other people like that. So, and you're on open table, so right. you can get it. Well, and I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, a restaurant to a large degree should be, you know, a reflection of, you know, mm -hmm. who you are and, and, you know, where you're at in your life. Yeah. And, um, you know, 15 years ago, um, when I was young and it was all about, you know, going out and trying Absolutely. to get me to the restaurant, you know, and I didn't have as many commitments, you know, Absolutely. You, you can be a little bit more fluid, but I'm certainly one of those myself that appreciates the ability to make a reservation and, and plan things like a babysitter. I, I was unemployed for a, a little while recently and I went and stood in line at restaurants and I'd say to my friends, I'll go stand in line, just get there when you can, you know. Right. Um, I want to spend a little moment here talking, because you do love wine and Absolutely. you know so much about wine. Uh, you, you pulled out some of the wines here that you're liking to drink this summer, and I thought maybe we would talk about them, and you just tell us what you would, what you would order off the menu, because these are wines we can get here at. So sure. this is the St. Jo Joseph Offeris? Offeris. Um, and this is a... It's, uh, it's, it's, a Rome, it's a Rhone wine, yes. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a... made by Jean Louis Chave. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I picked out uh, an assortment of wines yeah. because I think that, you know, the, the situations you're in are going to vary. Right. The, the types of night out you're gonna, you're gonna, are going to vary. And uh, that's the great thing about wine is having a different wine for every occasion. Um, uh, Jean-Louis Chave, in my opinion, is one of the best winemakers in the world. Mm -hmm. um, the offer is, I'd have to look, it's on the wine list for probably $65. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great... Uh, what would you, you know, have with it? Uh, lamb would be my first choice. And you love doing that. I do, lamb. I do. Yeah. Any of those bigger, richer, right. you know, zestier flavors, mm -hmm. the offers works well with. It's mm -hmm. it's a big red wine. It's a little spicy. Um, absolutely delicious. Nice. Uh, $60 is not a ridiculous price for a bottle of wine, I th that my opinion. Um, so this is this is a local Virginia wine, right. and, and, and I, it's... it's uh, you, will you talk about it? Well, so this is RDV, yeah. um, Lost Mountain, which right. uh, owned by owned by Rutger Devink, who is uh, in Della Plain, Virginia. Who's your partner in so. crime in a lot of ways? <laughs> you know? Yeah, we did. You know, Rutger is an amazing guy, and uh, he started his winery in 2008, and is really trying to to make it happen. You know, do um, a world class winery, and and he is doing a world class winery, and so. Being passionate about that, we've done a couple little things together. We've done a couple of events out there. Um, do you still do meals with him out there that people can come to? Well, right now they've been uh, meals that we've shared together right, out right, there, right, but right. We're, we're talking about doing something. You don't in have the fall. time to do that kind of stuff, but I know you get involved with uh, charities, and you've mm -hmm. done and you've done good works for them right. for the we've done, yeah, charities. Yeah, we've done a couple, of, a couple of things together. Um, and and you know the Virginia wine industry is interesting. It's 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 it keeps on chugging along. Right. And he is, uh, he's one of the most interesting uh, people doing uh, Virginia wines. So. Yeah, and I think that... So Rutger you know, deserves it, a big shout out. Absolutely, and it's, and it's funny putting the two together because, or, or you know, talking about the two right after each other, because Jean-Louis Chave is certainly one of the great winemakers of the, of the world. And he has a, a high-end wine, Hermitage, which would be, you know, yeah. much more the price, you know, not necessarily the price point, but the quality standpoint. That's what that you RDD have done in Metier, be. right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, so so while the the Chav offers is, you know, sort of my everyday wine, you know, uh, the RDV is something that I'm going to open with people that are really, um, really passionate about wine because they're going to appreciate it. You're going to have to pronounce this for me. Well, we're going to have to get somebody this Hungarian to okay. pronounce this for both Kral, of us. Kral de Dav Davar. Right. Kral yeah. de Davar. So that's the... It's a Tokai the, ferment? Ferment. So ferment is the, is the wine, See. and the Kari is the is the. You the did producer. that very well. You made me sound like an idiot, but that's okay. That's um, what I'm here for. Well, I was in Budapest last summer, so yeah, I had an advantage nice. over you. Um, so this is a white, I presume? It is. It and is. What would you compare it to in the spectrum of varietals? Uh, is it a Chardonnay? Is it no, a it's the what I love about uh, uh, Furman, especially for the summertime. Um, this one is a little bit richer, but it's a very high acid wine. Um, it has some minerality to it. Mm -hmm. um, has some you know lemoniness to it. Um, mm. This one has is a little richer, so um, could take you through to dessert practically. It, it, yeah, it's a white wine that goes with a lot of things in the mm -hmm. summertime. 
time when you're having herbs and fresh vegetables. Uh -huh. um, I think it goes great with all that. And then I'm not going to try to pick this up. The huet is well, that I, a domain huet? Yeah, I wouldn't pick that up either because because when dealing with bubbles, yeah, bigger bottles are always better than smaller bottles. <laughs> um, that's interesting. That's that, that's a good point to make. Yeah. And besides, if you're going to drink champagne or any sparkling wine, have a crowd, right? You well, know, or just I, one I, person or a few friends. I know this. If you're opening a bottle of champagne, I'm going to invite myself over. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's it's always good to have uh, friends when you're opening bubbles. Um, do you think that uh, a sparkling wine is the best way to start a meal? I, You know, again, I mean, with, with all things, it, it depends on, you know, the context. But um, For the palate. For, for, for the palate. Yeah, from a chef's yeah, point from, of view. From purely a chef's standpoint, I mean, that depends on what you're going to be having. I think, yeah, it does. It's a fun way to enliven your palate and get you well, excited and get you prepped for something. Are you one of those chefs who think that a bourbon or a scotch or a vodka anesthetize the palate a little bit? And this uh, yeah, op I'm, bubbles I'm, open it I'm, up a little bit? You know, for me, I'm not a huge, um, I don't drink a lot of alcohol. So yeah. starting out with something that, 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 that you know, is going to give also, me. It also sounds like you're not a chef who's going to tell customers what to do, which is, <laughs> which, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but I'd like to bring it back home a little bit and talk about the cuisine of our region. Mm -hmm. Here you are a chef who could have been still cooking in the Napa Valley or cooking in Manhattan or... I think you probably could have been cooking in France if you wanted to or anywhere you wanted to, but you chose to cook here in Washington. What of our indigenous food do you love and use? Well, with a lot of the, you know, a lot of the produce is, is, is easy because, um, We've got great you know, yeah, we have, we have, greens. we have some great farms, you know, locally. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the really fantastic things about this region is, you know, the Amish community that is up in, you know, near Lancaster, mm -hmm. you know, Pennsylvania, um, because you have a group of people that is still doing things, you know, sort of the old way. Um, that, you know, years ago I talked to uh, Path Valley, which is a co-op, um, about making butter for us. And they weren't at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and now they, now they, they do. do. We, we created a, a, a market for really them. really delicious. Um, but, you know, you having know people why. that, you know, know how to do that, uh -huh. um, you know, we'll get a veal from them periodically that um, when they have an extra one because, you know, they need, they need the mm -hmm. milk. But um, nobody's coming to the back door anymore, right? Uh, not, not, not as well. Not, uh, not. Holly was in the back, from the back door last night. She does your our beef at Martin Ranch. Where do your herbs come? We have a whole um, platter of your, what, what's this? These are coming from uh, Le Bay Garden in Delaplane. Plain, Virginia, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, uh, located at, at Anise? RDV. Anise hyssop, yeah. Okay. Um, and mm. for me, this is a, a great uh, summer herb um, and one that really reminds me of Virginia because this grows like a weed here. Yeah. Whereas, whereas California, it's rosemary mm -hmm. and fennel. Um, in, you know, the mid-Atlantic, it's anise hyssop. Um, and uh, we we do a lot with it. It mm -hmm. adds a great you know licorice flavor, anise flavor to, to what you're doing. Um, we have actually a um, sort of a little drink that we've been doing for people's anniversaries and, and birthdays, where we take a little berry cider and put a little um, scoop of the anise hyssop sorbet into it. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, it's uh, and and it's fun and it's delicious and it's lovely and it's you yeah. know it's just a great thing to enjoy. Um, what about um, what about the Chesapeake Bay? Yeah, I, I mean crabs, rockfish, uh, soft shrimp, shells? clams. Do you love soft um, shells? Love soft shells. Do you shells. prefer lump crab? I mean, which way do you like your crab best? Uh, yeah, I mean lump crab is is probably it's the brilliant food. Yeah, isn't it? I mean it's you know it's the easiest way to, to enjoy crab. Mm -hmm. um, you know we just got sugar toads in uh, the Chesapeake Bay. You know the baby blowfish, um, which are all, you know always a, a great thing that I love in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean we have we have uh, great you know area for, for seafood right on our back door. Have you have you noticed though or has it changed? I remember years ago that uh, what used to happen is the little buster crabs would come out of the bay, the sweet little soft shells, mm -hmm. and they'd go straight to Manhattan mm -hmm. and none would make it into DC. Has that changed? That has changed. You have some clout now right. where they're starting to bring things to the Washington restaurants? Well as as you know America's grown up you know, from a dining standpoint, the chef community has grown up as well. And so you now have a lot of the, you know, even casual restaurants today that have chefs that have trained f with somebody and no products are important and mm -hmm. no ingredients are important. And so now if you're, you know, Baxter's out on the Eastern shore, yeah. you have enough people in Washington that warrants, the, yeah. that, that warrants coming down here yeah. on a daily basis. Well, our time is up. So I would say that uh, it goes fast, doesn't it? it? Does. We could talk for another hour um, or two. 
Um, but uh, I would say that uh, anybody watching, listening should uh, get on open table or even use the phone the sure. old fashioned way. Um, come in here, try it out, kinship for a good time, medier for the special occasion, mix it up, do both in one night. I don't know, but I, I'm really thrilled that you were able to give us the time Absolutely. and it's been wonderful talking to you. And have a happy summer, Eric. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Carol. And thank you all. Until the next time. Thank you.